Hey everybody, Dr. Hall here, continuing our lecture, moving into male methods of contraception. So on the surface of it, right, it seems like it makes a lot more sense to unload a gun than to shoot at a bulletproof vest, right? Wouldn't it be lovely if we could just interfere with the production or the delivery of sperm on the male-bodied side of the equation? Well, it's a good idea in theory, but in practice, there are actually several challenges. So we're looking into it, right? So first of all, there's a lot of people studying and working on a male contraceptive, but there are some problems, right? First of all, instead of interfering with the production and release of one oocyte per month, we're dealing with millions of sperm every day. So there's not a lot of room for error, right? So just getting rid of 90% of them would still leave millions left. Um, so we, it's, it's tough, right? It's, and they're making new ones every single gosh darn moment. There's also some concern about adherence, right? Or remembering if it's a pill, for example, to take your pill every single day. Remember in female bodied people, the average person forgets five pills per month. And these are people that have pretty high stakes. They have a lot to lose, um, but a male bodied person is not at risk for getting pregnant. So they're gonna be even less motivated to remember to take their pill every day. The other thing about that is that the partner who's at risk of pregnancy in the equation wouldn't know whether he was taking his medicine or not, right? So talk about having to put a lot of trust and faith and confidence in somebody else, which in an ideal world with wonderful, healthy relationships, yes, absolutely, but in the real world, that's not often true. So people are working on it, but we have some concerns, right? So one is just might be physically difficult to interfere with the production of millions of sperm. The other is adherence or sometimes called compliance, right? Is he going to remember to take a pill every day? And is the partner who's at risk going to be able to know if he's been good about taking the pill every day? None of these methods have yet been developed to be FDA approved and available on the market. It's still early stages. There is not a male birth control pill yet. Um, and although using saunas and hot tubs because they elevate the temperature of the testicles, and as you'll remember, optimal temperature for spermatogenesis is around 93, 94 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the whole reason for a scrotum to begin with. Uh, but you can't just count on if you get in a hot tub every day for 10 minutes that you're not gonna make viable sperm, right? So that is not going to be an acceptable contraceptive. I will say one more thing is that, um, nope, never mind. Moving on. I talk a lot, right? So we're now more looking at, okay, how do we just block the journey of the sperm? So we've already talked about a lot of these things, right? So most of our hormonal contraceptives thicken cervical mucus and actually block sperm at the cervix. We'll talk later today about tubal ligation. And of course, the diaphragm and the sponge also physically block sperm entry into the cervix. Condoms can be used kind of at that pass off, that handoff from the male body to the female body, from the penis to the vagina. But they're also looking at things inside the male bodied person to block the journey of the sperm. So vasectomy, right, which is actually cutting of the vas, which we'll talk about later today, is effective but irreversible. They are currently working on several different prototypes for plugs that you can basically just put into the vas deferens, you know, so you kind of put a little plug in here. And if you do that, that will block sperm from being able to get up out of the testicle, out of the epididymis, and into, right, the urethra to be delivered. It won't interfere with the secretions from the seminal vesicles and the prostate, right? So you'd still have semen, you'd still have the fluids, you would still have ejaculate. There would just not be any sperm present in them. So they're working on these. Nothing is yet ready for prime time. We'll just have to see. So Another possible male method is withdrawal, officially called coitus interruptus, because coitus is the official term for sex. Um, and so this involves, as 
climax as orgasm is approaching the male has to remove his penis from the partner's vagina and get clear enough away so that the semen is not deposited in or near the vagina now theoretically this would be very highly effective and in fact in people who are good at this method who are have excellent self-control and excellent self-knowledge and they're really able to tell when the right moment is um, this can be highly effective so up in the 90s so 96 to 98 percent effective in people who are really skilled at this method the problem is that most people are not very skilled at this method. It can be very difficult as you're approaching climax or orgasm to pull out and stop what you are doing and to time it right so that you do it early enough. So it's really tricky to do in real life. So when we look at typical use effectiveness for withdrawal, it's actually fairly ineffective because this is hard to do correctly, right? Now, the other thing about it to, to consider is it can also be less pleasurable for the couple, right? So, um, you know, people may not want to choose this method for that reason as well. If we look at effectiveness of withdrawal, as I mentioned, if you're really good at it, only 4% will get pregnant in a year, but most people, about 27% will get pregnant in a year if this is the only form of birth control that they are um, using. So I want to draw your attention to the very bottom of the chart. This is going to be the most effective non-hormonal method, aside from abstinence, available. And it is the male condom or the penile condom. Perfect use effectiveness, only 2% will get pregnant. Typical use, 15%, which is more than a lot of people would like. A lot of people would like better than a 15, you know, they would like it to be lower. Uh, but that's pretty good as we compare it to these other non-hormonal methods. So let's talk more about the male or penile condom. So we're going to be blocking sperm that have been ejaculated from then getting into the vagina. And the nice thing about condoms is that they're also going to protect us against sexually transmitted infections because they prevent the exchange of body fluids. We'll talk about STIs more in two weeks, and there are some STIs that are transmitted through other mechanisms that condoms won't help as much with, but for those that are transmitted by that exchange of body fluids, condoms are excellent protection. Condoms have been around a long time, so it's kind of like IUDs. So we think that they date back to ancient Greece and Rome, and that they were initially made of linen, which would not have been terribly effective if you've ever looked at linen and seen all the holes in the weave, or animal intestines or bladder. Um, and in fact, there's a, the legend of King Minos, right? And part of it was that he was cursed and it caused his semen to contain scorpions. And so he actually used tissue from a goat's bladder as a condom. Uh, it's kind of interesting that his semen would kind of be burny. It makes me think maybe he had gonorrhea or chlamydia. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so there's a legend there. We know for sure that con condoms were around in 1642 because uh, there was one found in a cesspit in Dudley Castle. This is Dudley Castle down here, right? So we know for sure that they existed. And in 1855, the first rubber condom was made. And then in 1932, the first latex condom made by the company called Durex, which is still around today, which is really pretty cool. So condoms are, as we've discussed, very effective if used perfectly. It drops down to 85% with typical use because most people don't use them perfectly. So what are the problems that can occur with use? So breakage. Breakage almost always happens because you didn't use or handle them properly. And we know this for a fact because condoms have been used and people have been studying the use of condoms in female brothels for years, actually. So this is the Mustang Ranch. It is in Nevada. This is a municipality, not Las Vegas, uh, where prostitution is legal. And so some reproductive medicine fellows actually spent time working with these 
uh, sex workers who use condoms and they're experts at them and their condoms don't break. So the key important things are to squeeze the tip of the condom before you roll it down onto the penis, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. Uh, that leaves room for the semen so it has somewhere to go right if the end of the condom is flat and tight against the end of the penis then the force of the ejaculation could uh, weaken the condom and increase risk of breakage the other thing is improper handling so latex especially you want to keep it in a cool dry place not cold not hot so if you keep it in your wallet and it gets all that kind of friction especially if you keep your wallet in your pocket and you're sitting on it all the time and it's close against your body with your body heat all the time that's not going to be an ideal situation the glove compartment in your car that gets so hot on a sunny day and it gets so cold in the winter right so latex is not a material that stands up very well under those conditions but breakage is actually really rare if condoms are used correctly. The other common problem is slippage. So sometimes people will buy condoms that are too large for them. Uh, sometimes because it seems like a manly thing to do to buy the Magnum condom. Um, or sometimes people just have relatively slim penises and they need a slimmer condom. So sometimes the condom can slip off if the condom is too large. The other thing that can be an issue for slippage is waiting too long after ejaculation to remove the penis from the vagina. So you'll recall when we talked about the sexual response cycle that right after ejaculation, about 50% of the erection is lost, right? And then the other 50% gradually resolves over about the next 20 to 30 minutes during that resolution phase. So very soon after ejaculation, all of a sudden the penis is gonna get smaller in size, and so now the condom is going to be loose on the penis. So when you're finished with intercourse, you have to hold the base of the condom, or hold, yeah, hold the opening of the condom against the base of the penis while removing the penis so the condom doesn't slip off. Couple words about size. So the standard size condoms fit most people just fine. There are extra large sizes available, especially used for useful for people that have um, penises that are especially wide, right? So with a lot of girth, um, but that can increase risk of slippage if it's too big. So be careful about that. There are slim sizes available, usually called snug fit, and they can be harder to find, but they're in many drugstores. Sometimes you just have to read the fine print and you can also get them online. So it's super important to have a condom that isn't too loose You've probably seen uh, images of people putting condoms over their head or over their fists or something to demonstrate that there's no such thing as a condom that's too tight. Um, if it is super tight, however, that can cause discomfort for the person and sometimes even interfere with their ability to maintain an erection. So there is such a thing as a condom being too small or too tight, um, but usually the greater problem is that the condom is too large and loose. So here are some links on how to use a condom, and I'm going to talk through just a few tips, but the video does a much better job than I will. So first of all, you're going to want to wait till the penis is erect. When the penis is flaccid and soft, it's really hard to get a condom on it. It's just not worth trying. When you open the package, you're going to tear it open with your fingers. Don't use your teeth. Don't use a knife. Don't use something sharp that might accidentally puncture the condom. Then you have to take a look and see which way the condom is going to unroll because there's a right side and a wrong side. And if you have it on the wrong way, then it's not going to unroll down, unroll down the length of the penis very well. Then you're going to want it once you know where it's going to go, you're going to pinch the tip and hold that closed as you then unroll the condom along the length of the penis, holding that tip to create that reservoir for the semen to go into during ejaculation. 
You can put a small amount of lubricant inside the condom. A lot of condoms already have a little bit of lubricant on them. Um, just a little drop of extra lube sometimes really enhances sensation. Uh, so if you're like, ah, oh, I don't like condoms, it doesn't feel good, try putting just a little bit of lube inside the condom. A lot of people find that makes a big difference. Do not, do not, do not use two condoms at once. It is not better than just using one. The friction of the two condoms against each other increases your risk for breakage, so don't use two. After intercourse, right, so after ejaculation, you want to remove the penis before the erection is completely lost and holding the condom against the base of the penis so that it doesn't slip off. Remove the condom away from your partner and dispose of it. Clean off the penis before any further genital contact, right? So if there's any residual steam in there, you don't want that to come in contact with your partner. So there's three basic categories that condom of materials that condoms are made out of. The one that everyone is most familiar with is latex. It's really effective. It's nice and stretchy. It works really well. It blocks sperm and it blocks the viruses and the bacteria that can cause sexually transmitted infections. So that's great. Some people can be allergic or sensitive to it, however, and so for those folks, you might want to use the next category. So these are synthetic materials, right? Latex is from a rubber tree. These are synthetic materials made in a lab. They're basically plastics. The first one that was developed was polyurethane. Polyurethane's okay. I have to say it's less stretchy than latex. It also is kind of noisy. Uh, so a lot of people don't really like it as much as they like latex. There is a new synthetic on the market called polyisoprene. This one is really nice. It's used in the condom that goes it's marketed under the name Skin, S-K-Y-N, as well as others. And it tends to be really nice. It's really stretchy. I think it's kind of even better than latex, but what do I know? Uh, but the nice thing about these other synthetics is that they also block both sperm and STIs. The third category is lambskin. It's not technically lambskin. It's usually marketed as natural lamb. It's actually made from animal intestines. Um, it's not very stretchy. It's cold. It smells strange, um, but it will block sperm. But the thing about the lambskin condoms to know is that they have small pores in them through which viruses and bacteria can travel. So they do not protect you against sexually transmitted infections. Some people feel like they're more natural and they prefer the feel of it. Most people don't. They also are pretty expensive uh, compared to latex and the synthetics. So not really worth your investment for most folks. So there's lots of accessories that you can get. So lubricant can be really important. We've talked about it before. Remember, we've talked about the three different types, water-based, which can be with or without glycerin, silicone-based, and oil-based. You're never going to want to use oil-based lubricants with a latex condom because it will break down the latex. But most condoms come pre-lubricated with at least a little bit of lube because it improves sensation and decreases the likelihood of breakage. And as I mentioned, you might want to use a little bit of additional lubricant on the inside between the penis and the condom can improve sensation. And then sometimes, if depending on how much natural lubrication you have from the vagina, sometimes a little additional lubrication on the outside of the condom can be helpful as well. There are special lubricants that are also sold, and you just need to be a little careful <laughs> with these. So there's like this fire and ice and pleasure and all kinds of things. And so these are chemicals that cause some type of response in the tissues. And so some people are really sensitive to these, right? So think about putting, you know, jalapeno pepper on a sensitive mucous membrane. It certainly would heighten your sensation in a way, but perhaps in an unpleasant way. And I have actually seen some people get chemical burns of their vaginas from some of these special lubricant. So be really careful. If you want to try one, just try a little bit, see how it goes, make sure you don't have a bad reaction to it. I've had people where then they couldn't do anything at all with their vaginas for weeks until it healed. Uh, very unpleasant. 
then there are also the endurance type lubricants um, and these actually have numbing medicines in them right so benzocaine is a topical anesthetic um, that can help the the partner with the penis last a little longer before orgasm because it numbs them a little bit uh, therefore decreasing their sensation um, so it could be helpful to some people but it can also be irritating and you'd want to be careful to not get that side on your partner because then you'd numb your partner so you can try them if you want um, but they might be irritating and they might just be weird so what about spermicide right so wouldn't it be smart to have condoms that have spermicide on them but actually there's no evidence that a condom with spermicide is more effective than a condom without spermicide basically if the condom breaks or slips off a little tiny film of spermicide is probably not going to make a big difference and also you'll remember spermicide can be irritating and there's evidence that it can increase your risk of STIs so for these reasons condoms with spermicide are not recommended okay not recommended there's also all kinds of fun things other fun things with condoms like some have ribs or nubs or ridges or studs or all kinds of things um, and that might be pleasurable for your partner but you know because you learned about the nerve supply in the vagina that you would only be able to feel that in the lower third of the vagina the upper two-thirds of the vagina receives its nerve supply from the inner organs and it's very non-specific um, so this is my chance to reiterate a little anatomy there then there's you know vibrators and rings and bullets and all kinds of things which you know, it could be fun but it might be a little bit too much for some people so do students use condoms well so every couple of years the national college health assessment asks students this this happens to be data from 2012 it hasn't changed very much so i haven't bothered to make a new graph and so they asked both male and female bodied people about their condom use for vaginal sex and what we can see is that more than a third right so about 36 percent report always using condoms these are the people that are very unlikely to get pregnant and are very unlikely to get a sexually transmitted infection these people are the people that keep the student health center in business right so these folks even if you use them most of the time i can't tell you how many people i diagnose with chlamydia who say they use condoms and i say well sometimes always most of the time they're like well most of the time right all it takes is once uh, to get an infection and potentially to get pregnant so we still have a ways to go on improving condom use in people who are at risk for pregnancy and sti um, we're trying it's tough right but I don't know I think the new polyisoprene condoms might help when we ask people about condom use for anal sex it's really interesting so once the motivation to protect against pregnancy is gone right because there are also female bodied people in this study right you are much less likely to use a condom right um, and a lot of people never use condoms for anal sex which is uh, problematic because anal sex is a higher risk for transmission of several types of sexually transmitted infections than vaginal sex is but I know we're talking about birth control now so in summary for the male methods withdrawal can be relatively effective but it's very difficult to do perfectly and so we do not recommend that condoms can be very highly effective if used properly they're a little bit easier to use properly although still typical use effectiveness is just 85 percent but that's way better than not using them problems with usage right so problems with use tend to be breakage it doesn't fit so it slips not removing it properly the nice thing about condoms is they also protect protect against STIs and we talked about the three different materials so latex which is kind of the standard works really well but some people are sensitive to it so we have the newer plastics polyurethane and polyisoprene my personal favorite um, they tend to work really well and then beware of the natural lamb or lamb skin because they do protect against pregnancy sperm can't get through them but bacteria and viruses can so we'll pick up our next section is going to be on emergency contraception which might be what you're going to reach for if the condom breaks <laughs> 